It's good to be in the house of God. I, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to declare the word of God. And I believe it's a, a special moment to be here at the finale of this time and season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, January is probably my favorite month of the year because of the prayer and the fasting. I am a church junkie. I love prayer. I love worship. I love being at the church. And every January, I just love being in the prayer meetings and seeking God. And uh, that's one of my favorite times. So to be here today, when Pastor Todd and I had originally talked, he said, I want you to come at the end of our time of prayer and fasting and just deliver a word to us. And uh, I've just been praying this week and asking the Lord, what would he have me to share with you this morning that would lift your faith? encourage you and really set you on the right course for this year. And uh, the Lord just really directed me to a, a word from Romans chapter four. And I want you to turn over there with me this morning, Romans chapter four. And I, I'm going to read verse 16 down through verse 18. This is absolutely one of my most favorite passages in the whole Bible. And uh, I, I really feel like the Lord wants to do a work in some hearts this morning. And so we're going to read this. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We're going to read this, and then we're going to pray when we get done with verse 18. It says here, so the promise is received by faith. How's it received? By faith. And it's given as a free gift. Everybody loves something free, isn't that right? And we're all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Now that's a good place to say amen right there. Notice that he said he believes in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. That about covers everything I believe that there is to cover. Any problem you have today, any situation you're ever going to face, he can bring the dead back to life and create new things out of nothing. In other words, God's got your back and he's got you covered. Verse 18 is where I really want us to focus today and I believe is the word from the Lord for us today. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. I want to focus in on that. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We just thank you for your word, that it brings life, it brings energy, it brings enthusiasm into our spirit, man. And Lord, we dedicate this time to you. We've worshipped you. We've entered into your presence. We felt your glory in this house. And Lord, today we just ask that faith would come as the word is declared. I pray that it would not fall on any unfertile or callous ground, but that it would produce a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. Lord, we we just claim your word that it cannot return void, but that it will accomplish exactly what you intended it to. And Lord, today we speak to the hopeless. We speak to the hopeless situation. We speak to everything in our life that may seem to be impossible or out of reach. And we declare the hope of God today in our lives. We declare that faith is alive for the impossible. And we declare today, Lord, that something is going to be deposited in this house that is going to reside and resound in the future. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, oh, you can do better than that. Everybody said, amen. amen. There we go. A good, strong amen. I, I want to speak to you for all you faithful note takers today on the subject. Hope is alive. Hope is alive. You know, there's going to come a point or there may be something right now in your life where the enemy comes after your hope because hope is the prerequisite for faith. Another way to say it is hope is faith in its infancy. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now 
Faith is the substance of things what? Hope for. So in other words, you can't have faith if you don't have hope. Hope is your part. The supernatural, the faith is God's part. So you, you got to maintain your part of the deal and at least have hope because God will never override your hope in doing something supernatural. If Abraham had quit hoping, there would be no Isaac and there would be no God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God would have found him somebody else and, and who, who didn't lose hope. And so I want to encourage you today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of my testimony to, to really stir your faith, but, but to see things from a different perspective, that, that God is the God of hope. And Abraham was known for his faith, but his faith could have never been known had he given up hope. And several years ago, uh, I, I found myself uh, really at a place where I was feeling hopeless. And uh, for those of you who do not know me, at the age of 16, I experienced kidney failure and went on kidney dialysis. And uh, for the last 21 years, I have been in a battle with chronic renal failure, kidney failure. And I uh, was placed at 16 years old on kidney dialysis three times a week. And I entered into a long, long battle for my life and with kidney failure. And this battle has raged for 21 years. And uh, in 2011, the Lord really just began to visit me because my hope was was waning. My hope was giving out. And, you know, raised in the church, I know all the right things you're supposed to say. And I know all the right things you're supposed to believe. But sometimes you can know what you're supposed to do and you still can't do it. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you know you're supposed to praise, but you just don't feel like it. And you know you're supposed to worship, but you can't stop worrying. And it, there's there's all these things that come against us. And 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 I know we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. And we're supposed to keep our confession strong and all that. But you know what? My hope was dying. And and here's what the devil knows. He's a master abortionist. He knows if he can kill your hope, then he'll eliminate your faith. In other words, he always tries to kill in infancy what he doesn't want to face in maturity. Think about Moses. He tried to kill Moses and have him thrown into the Nile River. But you know what? God spared him. And what happened? He grew up and he was a deliverer. Think about Jesus. Oh, Herod was a type of the devil. He tried to kill Jesus in infancy because he didn't want to have to face him in maturity because by the time he came to tempt him in the wilderness, it was too late he had grown up. The Bible says he grew in spirit and in stature. And, and so the devil doesn't want to face your faith because faith can move mountains. So he comes after your faith at the place where it's most vulnerable, and that's when it's a flicker of hope. So hope, it's the prerequisite. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and say, your problem is that you've given up hope and your faith is dying. And of course, like any good preacher, I said, devil, I rebuke you. But it was true. And so I did what I believe we're supposed to do. I went to the word of God and I began to seek out this subject of hope. And I realized that, that in all of the messages, the hundreds and hundreds of messages that I had preached, I had never preached a single message on hope. I didn't know anything about hope, Pastor Todd. I knew about faith, but I didn't know about hope. And so I began to search the scriptures and it came, this was at the end of the year and January came around and, and, and I felt compelled to read through the whole Bible in the book, in, in the month of January. And, and so I decided to highlight the word hope throughout the Bible and I found it over 250 times in the scriptures. And, and I found the one time that ministered to me the most and impacted my life the most. And it was this verse right here. Aren't you glad I did all that research for you? I went cover to cover, and I found the best verse, and I'm going to give it to you today. That's priceless right there. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham did what? 
He just kept hoping. It didn't make any sense. We're going to talk more about that in a second. It, it defied logic. It, it didn't fit with the normal pattern of things. We got a 75-year-old and a 65-year-old woman unable to have children, and they're given a promise that they're going to have children. And the fact that he even believed it in the first place was pretty amazing faith. But when year after year and decade after decade went by and they're just getting older and older and it seemed more impossible, you, you would think that he would give up hope, but old Abraham just refused to give up hope. You know what? Something started getting down inside and say, I'm going to be like Abraham. I don't care if it's been 25 days or 25 years. I'm not giving up my hope. I'm just going to keep hoping. And I don't care what Dr. Smell Fungus says. And I don't care what A Ain't Brute Hilda says. And I don't care what Uncle Couillon says. Come on, somebody. I'm going to keep hoping. And, and you know why? Because I got a promise in God's word, in my case, for healing. By his stripes, I was healed. Now, if you're hoping for something God didn't promise, you just got a wish, and you might as well wish to win the Powerball because you don't have a promise to back it up. But when there's a promise to back it up, you got hope. It's not a wish. It's hope. And it says, you know what? I believe in God's word. I don't impossible. I don't care how long it's been. I don't care who says it can't happen. I don't care what my past experience has been. I am going to just keep on hoping because my hope, my hope is what's keeping me hitched up to the supernatural power of God. That's right. And as long as, as long as I got hope, I'm hitched up to the power. It's like a truck and a trailer. I'm the trailer. He's the, he's the truck. And my hope is that little thing that hooks on and says, I'm not letting go. That's what hope is. And, and so I began to, I began to get a hold of this and I began to, to, to meditate on this and, and God began to, to, to work in my life and, and bring my hope to a fresh place of being alive and ignited and, and, and my faith began to soar and, and the Lord began to show me many things about hope. And, uh, one of the things that he showed me because hope is such an intangible, we have to have a picture many times. We have to have something that helps us to really get our arms around it. And my, my grandfather, brother Roy Stockstill, who started our church there in Baton Rouge many years ago, he built a place in New Mexico up in the mountains because my grandmother didn't like the heat when it gets really hot down here. I know y'all don't know nothing about that. but And so he built her a place, and from April to October, they would get, they would, they would get away from the heat, and they'd go up into the cool mountains in New Mexico. And they were about 7,000 feet above sea level and a beautiful... There was a valley full of wildflowers, and all summer long there was different wildflowers. And I mean, it was just heavenly. And they would go out there, and and I would go out there with them as a young boy. And I remember when we get there, the first thing we'd do, we'd go up into the attic, and we'd light the pilot light. And I said, Papa, what is that? He said, This is the pilot light. This is going this is going to make the the hot water heater work because ice cold water came from the mountains. If you didn't have hot water, you you couldn't even think about showering or anything. It was just ice cold. And, and the Lord showed me, said, hope is the pilot light of your faith. And the, the most vulnerable point on, on a hot water heater is that pilot light. Because all it takes is a little, and you put that pilot light out and you, you can have an amazing hot water heater. It can be 40 gallon tank. It, it, it can do, it can do everything right. And, and you can't really hurt a hot water heater. You get out a hammer and bang on it. It's, it's sturdy. But you know what? If you put out that pilot light, it's not going to do you any good. And the Lord said, he said, your hope is the pilot light of your faith. Once your faith gets lit, there's nothing the devil can do to stop it. So he tries to come along and blow on that pilot light. Abraham, he got something down inside of him with this. He said, you know what? I can't make a miracle happen. I can't make, 
Isaac come along. I can't make the promise of God be fulfilled. But what I can do is keep hoping. What I can do is get up every day and say, I still hope. I can get up every day and declare to those around me, you know what? My hope is still in the word of God. It, and they didn't even know what I was preaching on in that last song. They said, uh, my hope is in you. All my hope is in you. You know, are we just singing that? Does that sound good? Does it rhyme with the line before? Or do we really believe that? So the Lord showed me there are two enemies to hope that try to come and blow out the pilot light or hope. The first one is logic. Logic and reason. You know, science says if something happens 99 times in a row the same way, it's going to happen the same way on the 100th time. But you see, that's not how God works. Abraham was 99 years old, and everything had been the same for 99 years. No kid, no kid, no kid, no kid, 99 times. And guess what? 100 times, bump, kid. But the mind says, well, every other time it's worked this way. Well, I don't care about every other time. Because faith supersedes logic. We walk by faith and not by sight or by our senses. We, we, we believe that God is able to do something different the next time. It may be the next day. It may be the next week. It may be the next month. It may be the next year. It may be the next decade. We don't know. That part's not up to us. The only thing that's up to us is to believe that something is going to change. We don't have to figure out how. We don't have to figure out when. We don't figure out who. None of that. All we have to do is just say, God, I know you promised it in your word, and I'm going to keep putting my hope in your word. I'm going to keep hoping. I'm going to keep hoping. I'm going to keep hoping day after day, week after week, year after year. I'm going to keep hoping. My job is to keep hoping in your promise. My job is to not give up that child that's been on drugs and been wayward and been away and you hadn't heard from them and you don't know what's going on in their life. And it's been years and it's been years and, and the devil's telling you, oh, nothing's ever going to change. They're going to be this way forever. You're going to go to your grave and they're still going to be out there and addicted to drugs or whatever it is that they're in. And you have to say, shut up, devil. My hope is in God. It's never been in you. I don't listen to you. I'm not listening to reason. Just because it's been that way for the last year or five years or 10 years or 20 years doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way because my hope is in the God who's able to raise the dead back to life and to create new things out of nothing. Now think about old Abraham. He's 75. God tells him, hey, you and Sarah, you're going to have a son. That was, a, that was probably a pretty hard thing to swallow. But he believed God. God counted it unto him as righteousness. And then about 10 years went by. And old Abraham, he's 85. Sarah's 75. Listen, whatever hope there was at 75 and 65, which was none, was even less at 85 and 75. And then another couple of years go by, and we got 90 and 80, and it's like, it's over. Year after year, can you imagine? I, I, I just, I laugh because I like to put myself in the context uh, of these stories and make them come alive. Can you imagine you get invited over to Abraham and Sarah's house for dinner? And you go over, and they probably had a big tent. Bob, they, they were living in big, he had, had a big plush tent. And, uh, Abraham was wealthy. He had servants. They put on a big feast. You go over there, and you're excited to go to Abraham and Sarah's house. They got the nicest house in the neighborhood, and, and, uh, they got their, their, their Rolls Royce camel parked out front. And you show up, and, and, and dinner's not quite ready, and they say, we're going to give you a tour of our little uh, tent castle here. And so we start going around different rooms. You see their living room, and you, you see all these, and then you come to this room that's fixed up like a nursery. And 
and, and you say, oh, isn't this sweet? And it's, 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 it's all powder blue and got little toy trucks and little things like that. You say, oh, y'all must have a great grandson. I mean, they're 98 and 88. Y'all must have a great grandson. No. Oh, y'all, maybe y'all had kids later in life, y'all. Y'all must have a grandson. No. And then Abraham looks over at Sarah, and Sarah looks back at Abraham. Abraham says, we're actually expecting. And you're like, uh, expecting what? <laughs> you you order something on Amazon or... Abraham says, yeah, we're expecting a child. He said, oh, you are? Well, well, when are you due? He said, well, we don't know. We're not exactly pregnant, but we're expecting. And you're sitting there thinking, yeah, because you ain't never going to be pregnant. She's 88, you're 98. I'm just impressed you aren't walking around in this big thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, if that was me and my wife, I'd tell her, honey, Get your stuff. We we ain't eating at these people's house. They crazy. They got a little something extra back there in the kitchen, I think. Cause this 98-year-old dude is talking about having a baby with his 88-year-old wife. It is not safe to eat their gumbo. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> think about it. You think your situation's impossible. You think people think you're crazy for believing God, even in the midst of whatever it is that you're walking through. Think about Abraham and Sarah. That's why we're still talking about them today, 4,000 years later. Because they just kept on hoping. They just kept hoping. They just kept hoping. They just kept hoping. Didn't make any sense. In fact, it made less and less sense. They just kept on hoping. And, and in this they brought glory to God. In this, they brought glory to God. Now, if you look down here in verse 22, it says, Abraham, at verse 20, rather, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. For he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. You know, and I, I've wrestled with this, and I said, God, why don't you just heal me so you can get some glory out of this situation? You know, we try all kind of tactics with God. God, this is really about you. It's not about me. It's about you. Except it's about me. The Lord taught me something. He said, in your humanity, you only see the glory when the big bang comes. We don't give an athlete glory till he hits the, the winning shot at the buzzer. But God says, I don't work that way. He said, where I get the most glory is when nothing has happened and you still believe me. He said, he said, he asked me this question. He said, what would have happened if Abraham and Sarah would have had a kid at 30 and 20? I said, nothing. It has happened about 7 billion times here recently. I said, exactly. He said, it's because it seemed impossible and they believed me even when it made no sense that it brought me glory. And, and even though we're saying, God, why don't you do this? Why don't you save my relative? Why don't you heal my body? Why don't you, why don't you help me get out of debt? Why don't you help me in my marriage? And, and, and the Lord says, because I'm going to get some glory out of this. If I just made everything perfect the moment you became uncomfortable, it would never bring any glory to God. But it's when people see that you're believing God, even in the midst of it not changing and seeming to be impossible, that's when God gets the glory. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hope is faith in its infancy. 
He says, God, I don't, you know what? I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the right verses memorized. I, I, I don't know everything there is to know, but one thing I can do, I can get up every day and hope and not let go of this book. That woman with the issue of blood, she, every day, 12 years, she suffered many things and many physicians. But one day she heard that the, the man from Galilee was in town. And everything changed that day. Why did it take 12 years? Why did it take 25 years for a, I don't know. We'll never figure that out. My little pea brain isn't suited to figure out all those mysteries. But one thing I can do is keep hoping and say hope is alive. Tell your neighbor, say hope is alive. Tell your other neighbor, say hope is alive. So the first enemy of our hope is reason. The second enemy is time. You know, we're taught to believe that the more time goes by, the less likely it is for what we believe is going to happen. But see, real hope operates the opposite. Real hope says the longer that time has gone by, the more sure I am that it's right around the corner. So during the time of prayer and fasting, 2012, the Lord was speaking to me about hope. I was going up to the church almost every day in the morning and spending all day there in the presence of God and praying and seeking God. And one day I was just praying and I had been saying, Lord, show me a picture of hope. Show me a picture. Give me something that helps me to know about this hope Holy Spirit, lead me into, into truth. And I was sitting there praying, and all of a sudden I was caught into sort of a vision. And Pastor Todd, I looked around me, and all I could see was pitch black. And I looked, and, and I was sitting in, in, in the sanctuary there at Bethany South, and there was lights on and everything. But I was sitting in the pitch black. I could see nothing. And I felt fear begin to grip my heart. And, and, and something, something told me, you're in a dungeon. And I felt like I was way underneath the earth and, and, and I, I, I couldn't see anything and, and, and I felt some fear and, and, and I felt hopelessness and, and I felt it creeping in on me and the darkness was so tangible. It felt like you could touch it. And I looked around me and because I could see no light, I thought, I'm in a prison cell. I'm in a dungeon. I'm underground. And then I heard a voice speak to me, and it said, look again. And this time, as I began to look, and my eyes began to adjust, I saw way in the distance, I saw light. Way in the distance. I couldn't even tell. I, I didn't know if it was a mile, five miles. I, I did not know. All I knew is that I could see light. And all of a sudden, I knew that I was in a tunnel, not a dungeon. See, the difference between a tunnel and a dungeon is one has a way out, the other doesn't. See, the world's hopelessly caught in the dungeon of sin. They, don't, they have no escape. They have no way of hope without Jesus in their life. But we are not as those who have no hope, Paul said. And so I knew that I was in a tunnel. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke something to me that rocked me. And it changed my life. It, it, this is what he said to me. He said, hope is seeing light at the end of the tunnel when you're standing in the pitch black. Hope is seeing light at the end of the tunnel when you're standing in the pitch black. And, and initially, I looked around, and it was pitch black. And I thought, my God, I'm in a dungeon. But as I began to look with the eyes of faith, I began to see that there was light at the end of the tunnel. So, so here's the difference between hope and hopelessness. If you're hopeless, you sit down in that dungeon and you die there. Because hopelessness will turn the tunnel into a dungeon. But hope says, if I'll just keep walking... If I'll just keep getting up every day, this morning I got up, 
I'm here in Lafayette, Louisiana. I was looking at the Cajun Dome. The sun came up, and I said, Lord, I thank you. I'm alive another day. I thank you that I'm breathing air on planet Earth. I can preach another message. I can show your love to another person. I can minister the message of hope to somebody else every day. And you know what? You're going to take thousands, maybe millions of steps before you break out of that tunnel. But as long as you keep moving, there's hope. And the moment you sit down and stop and give up, it's hopeless. And the devil tries to play tricks on you. He tries to get you to embrace hopelessness because thats it's only really hopeless when you believe it's hopeless. When you give up and sit down, and, and here's the good news. There are people here today, and I say this to you by the Spirit, you have had a situation, a loved one, a child, a, a family member, a relationship, a financial problem, a, a, a physical issue. There, there's a million different things it could be, and you've given up, and you've laid down, and you've allowed your situation to become a dungeon. And today, this message is coming along, and it's going to be like air in a balloon that's been deflated. All of a sudden, you're going to begin and become inflated by the hope of God. You're going to stand back up and you're going to start walking. One step at a time. And I'm not here, I, I'm not one of those preachers who tell you your breakthrough's coming in 60 seconds and, 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 and give $32 and in the next 32 days, you're going to see 32 miracles. And No, 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 no. I've been through too, I've been through too much for all of that. I've been, I've been around this, this, this church thing my whole life. And I'm here to tell you that God is going to do what God's going to do when he's ready to do what he's wanting to do. And I believe in miracles and I believe in giving and I believe in all of that. And you do whatever the Lord tells you to do. Mary said, do whatever he tells you to do. And that's all well and good. But I'm here to tell you the most important thing is that you put one foot in front of the other and you start walking. You don't know how far it is to that light. You don't know what that light is going to look like. You just know I'm moving towards the light. And, and, and the more you walk, the more confidence you get. The more your faith is ignited, the more your faith is energized, and, and you start taking bigger strides, and, and, and you may even break into a run at some point because you know at some moment you're going to burst out of this tunnel and it's been a long, dark tunnel. Maybe it's been so long you can't even remember what the front of that tunnel looked like. But you're going to break out into the favor of God's sunshine and his warmth. You know, for me, in 2000, I was called into the doctor's office, the head of my nephrology clinic there in Baton Rouge. And I'd been in and out of the hospital, been at death's door. I was 6'5", 127 pounds, Pastor Todd. Now, you, you think I'm skinny right now. I weigh 180 pounds right now. You should have seen me at 127. Had lost almost all my hair. My eyes were sunk into my head. Got called in. Me and my mother went down. Went, we knew something was going on because we had never been in the, the office of the doctor. We had always just been in the checkup room type place. and. Uh, he said, uh, Ms. Stockstill, I called you and Joel here today. You got to remember, I'm 20 years old. My kidneys had failed four years earlier. I'd been on dialysis. I'd been going through all kind of hell. I had a kidney transplant at Mayo Clinic. It didn't work. Almost died up there in ICU. And I was sitting there, and he said, I've got to give you some news. The, the, the bad news is, is that Joel has six weeks to six months to live. When you're 20 years old, that's not what you're wanting to hear. The bad news is, uh, the good news is, if he'll stay in bed and do his treatments, he'll probably live six months. If he doesn't, he'll live six weeks. And, I mean, I can't even tell you the feeling that I had in hearing that. And I thought about all the prophecies I had received, how many men of God had laid their hand on me and declared that I would preach the gospel to the nations. And my mind was saying, is this it? I hadn't preached anywhere. 
I, I hadn't even crossed the state lines yet. You know, you, you go one state over, you become a national evangelist. You go to Mexico, you're an international evangelist. I hadn't even preached in Mississippi. And none of the promises had come true. But up out of my spirit, I had not read through the Bible a bunch of times like I have now. I hadn't preached a thousand messages. I didn't, I didn't know what I knew now. But up out of my spirit, I don't even know what translation, I, none of that. I just pointed my little bony finger across that desk at him. Right? I don't even remember what he was saying. I just interrupted him and said, I will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And I remember him putting up his hands, and he knew we were crazy. They already knew that. Three months before I'd been in ICU, they didn't get me through the night to live. They called the intercessors up there, and they got out there and was praying in tongues and Jericho marching and scared everybody half to death up at the hospital. But it worked. I came out. Hey, listen, when you're, when you're on your deathbed in ICU, you don't care who gets offended or scared or weirded out or what. Get somebody who knows how to pray up there and let them do what they do. Five years later, I was in a pastor, now a pastor on staff there at Bethany, and I had a checkup with my doctors, and I went, and I was by the hospital, so I stopped by to pray over some people. I had my suit on. That's back when we wore suits, you know. Thank God we've been delivered for the most part. But I had my suit on, and, and I went and prayed over some people, and then I went up there, and I was waiting in the, in the, in the doctor's office. I was sitting over in the chair, because I don't like sitting up on that table with all that crinkly paper and stuff. I'm like, that's for the sick folks. I'm not sick. I was sitting in the corner just waiting, and in walks the doctor, and it wasn't my regular doctor. It was the doctor who I had met with five years before who said I had six months max to live. And so he evidently had looked at my chart and was surprised that I was still alive. And he walked in kind of, and I stood up and walked across the room to shake his hand, and he about fainted. And he said, I, I, I can't believe this. This is a miracle. That was, that was 2000. That was 2017. So uh, his prediction was just a little bit off. I'm stronger than I've ever been today. I've got more life working in me than ever before. The Zoe life of God is operating in me. I got more energy and strength and vision and fire than I've ever had. And you know what? I'm still in the middle of this battle. Friday, I was in the, the clinic getting my blood cleansed, doing dialysis treatment. And if something doesn't happen in the next 24 hours, a miracle, I'll be there tomorrow. I've done over 3,000 dialysis treatments. I know what it's like to face hope, but you know what? I just keep getting up every day. I just keep putting my hope in God. I just keep walking towards the light. I don't know how far it is to the light, but I'm just going to keep walking by faith. By I'm not going to keep looking around and get all hopeless and lay down and make this a dungeon. I'm going to make it a tunnel, and it's a long tunnel. It's been a long, dark tunnel. But one day I'm going to break out of this tunnel into the light of God's sunshine and his favor. And oh, the glory that's been given to God even now. Oh, yeah, when the miracle happens, yeah, they'll be rejoicing and all that. You'll, you'll hear a shout from wherever it is I'm, I am at that time. But I'm bringing them glory today. I see God get, getting glory today. I'm standing before you today giving him glory because I refuse to let up hope. And reason and time is not going to wear me down. The pilot light of my faith is going to stay lit. I'm going to stay hooked up to, to the power source of God's word. And I believe today hopelessness has been exposed. And the hope of God is filling hearts afresh. I want you to bow your heads with me. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for being so attentive. It's truly been an honor to be here with you today. I want to do two things.
this morning with heads bowed. First of all, I want to pray for those who don't know Jesus and truly have no hope. And then secondly, I want to pray a prayer over all of you today because I believe the enemy comes after our hope so vicious, viciously and violently as believers. That's what we are. We're believers. And he comes after that hope. And I want to pray over you. But first, I want to extend an invitation to those of you who may not know the Lord. This morning I was riding with your youth pastor, Brady, here, and he was telling me about six years ago when he gave his life to the Lord right here. And oh, what a change, a glorious change that happened in his life and the course of his eternity and hundreds and thousands of people was changed as he said yes to the Lord right here. And I believe that today may be your day. Maybe you're here and you're hopeless because without Christ there is no hope. The Lord is extending the lifeline of the hope of Jesus Christ to you today. And you're drowning in the floodwaters of judgment and sin. And a lifeline has been extended through the very word of God. And I know today's message was not a salvation message, but that doesn't matter. You've heard about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And if that's you, you're in here this morning and you say, Joel, I need prayer today. I need to receive the hope of Calvary. I need to receive the hope of Christ in my life. You know who you are. You know what's going on in your life. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you. If that's you and you say, that's me, Joel, I need you to pray with me today. I don't want to walk out of these doors without knowing the hope of salvation. I want you right there in your seat without hesitation. Don't think about it. Don't put it off. Don't don't mull it over. You know who you are. If you need the hope of Christ, I want you without hesitation just to lift your hand and say, that's me. All over, all over, all over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Men, women, young people, all over. That's me. Joel, pray for me today. This is my greatest privilege. My highest honor is to introduce people to Jesus. That's right, all over. Hand, people just lifted their hands saying, that's me. You may put your hands down. Maybe you once knew the Lord, but today you need to come back because you find yourself in a hopeless, backslidden state and you need to come back to the hope of Calvary. If that's you and you haven't lifted your hand yet, I want you to just lift up your hand right there and you see, say, that's me. I'm backslidden. I need to come back to the Lord. As I look around from my left to my right here today, that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want everyone very reverently just to stand to your feet. And I'm going to invite in just a moment, those of you who lifted your hand or you didn't and wish you would have, to make a commitment today to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you in just a moment, I'm going to come down here on the floor. I want you to come down here and meet me right here. I want to lead you in a prayer of faith, confession of faith. And I, I am believing today that the hope of God is going to fill your heart your faith is going to become active and you're going to engage with the Savior, Jesus Christ. If that's you, wherever you are, I want you to just make a move and get out into the aisle and come and stand right here with me, shoulder to shoulder. From wherever you are, just make a move. Put act. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Put action. It's not just a want to. It's a I have to. I've got to make that move. Here comes this precious lady right here. There were women. There were men. Just come right here, shoulder to shoulder. This young man, just step up a little bit closer. Just come up a little bit right here. That's right. This couple, these four. Is, is there anyone else? There were many hands. This precious man right here. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. This couple right here, all over. You're here. You need to come to the foot of the cross today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Is there anyone else? This special one, just come right here. Thank you, Lord. Ten souls being rescued out of the hands of the enemy today and brought into the kingdom of God. Now, I want you ten precious ones that have come here this morning, I want you to just put your hand over your heart. Because that's where the work of salvation begins. It's in your heart, not in your head. Your head will tell you all kind of crazy stuff. It's your heart. That's where it begins. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of faith. I want everybody out here, I want you to stretch your hands out towards them because we support them. We love them. We're coming around them as a family of God. And just say this prayer with them. But I want you, ten. I want you to say out loud. I mean, I don't hold back. Don't mumble it. Don't grumble it. 
Say it out loud. And we're going to confess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to the cross, the foot of the cross, where your blood was shed. And I receive today redemption, forgiveness for my sins. I have fallen short of your perfect standard. And today, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins and I receive your grace, your unmerited grace. I don't deserve it. I deserve judgment. But you gave grace through your death on the cross. You paid the price for all of my sins. And today, Lord Jesus, I receive righteousness. I receive righteousness. I receive redemption from your sacrifice. And from this day forward, I will serve you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give them a big hand clap of praise. Oh, man, God is doing a work in your heart. Let me say this to each one of you that's coming. This is the beginning. Salvation is not a, yeah, well, that's on my bucket list. I better make sure I'm okay before I die. Check. No, that's not salvation. Salvation is a journey. It's a walk. It's an adventure. I want to encourage you. If you don't have a good local church, which you probably don't, that's why you're here. I want you to get plugged in here to the family of God. These people love you. It's not about just going to church. It's about being the church and being around the church and fellowship with the church and, and growing in the things of God. I can't think of a better place to do that than right here. So today, something, something supernatural has begun in your life. A special work has begun. And we're all still surrendered to that very work in our life. I'm still surrendered to that work. Pastor Todd is still surrendered to that work. Today, you surrender to that work. So what I want to ask you to do in just a moment, I'm going to release you back to your seats. There's going to be a little card there. I want to ask you to fill that out and turn that in so we can be in touch with you. Our, our goal is to give you opportunity to connect with other believers, to be able to grow and thrive in the things of God. But today is the beginning of the best of your life. I believe that you're on the path to eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless you, brother. Okay, so I'm going to dismiss you right back to your seats. That little card, do we give that to them here? This is the little card. If you'll fill that out, I made a decision. We'd love to get that back from you in just a moment. Now, I want to do something before I turn it over to Pastor Todd. God has given me an anointing because I've walked, what I've walked through, this message is not some little message that I dug up one day when I was studying and thought, oh man, that would be a good thing to speak on. No. This, this is my life message. This is, this is not just where I was, but where I am. And it, it, this is my testimony. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. This is my testimony of overcoming the devil. 21 years of kidney failure. And I don't know what may have attacked your faith, where you are, what you're facing, or what you may face in the future. But I want to pray a fresh infusion of the hope of Christ over your life. In fact, there were two verses in Romans that spoke to me above every, all of the verses in the whole Bible. And there's some great ones in Psalms. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, I'm going to read this and I'm going to pray over you. Paul said, I pray that God, the source of hope, who's the source of hope? God will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We see two different references to filled and overflow. I want your cup today to overflow with hope. If that's you, you say, I need that fresh hope. I want you to just lift your hands right there where you are 
And, and I'm going to pray over you today because there's an anointing here for whatever situation, whatever trial, whatever problem, no matter how long, no matter how great. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person here today. I thank you that the hope of God is alive in this place. You are the God who raises the dead back to life and who brings new things out of nothing. And Lord, today, we thank you that hope is springing alive in the hearts of every person here. I thank you, Lord, that hopelessness is defeated. Depression, discouragement are defeated by the nail that was driven through your feet. We have victory over discouragement, depression, and defeat. And Lord, today, I release the hope of God into every life, every wayward child, every financial, physical situation, every marital situation, everything, every job job situation, everything that the enemy would try to do to, to destroy our faith and ruin our hope, I rebuke it today in the name of Jesus, and we release fresh hope today. Fresh hope today. Fresh hope today. And we declare hope is alive. Hope is alive. Hope is alive. Hope is alive. If we've been laying down in the dungeon, we're standing up and we're making it back into a tunnel. We're beginning to walk again towards the sunlight of your favor. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Todd. I brought with me today my little book, my testimony. It's called Faith That Endures. And I brought some copies of that and uh, some different things. I'll be out in the foyer. I'd love for you to pick up a copy of that, maybe get two or three, give to somebody you know that's walking through a hopeless situation. And uh, I like to sign them, put little scriptures in them and things. I'd love to meet you. So I'll be out there in the foyer immediately after the service. But God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise today.